All right. How's everyone doing? Uh, let's see. Happy midterm day. As a reminder, the midterm scores should be out by now. I submitted them before the deadline this morning. And the letter, the vague letter grade that you see will be your a representation of your current average in this class, including best one, the labs, the homeworks up to chapter five, and the quizzes up to chapter five. Now, that letter grade is, again, very vague, because C and above is all just S. So, um, so that students can actually know their real averages. One, you can always just ask me. Uh, that's not hidden information. I will gladly tell you what your current scores are. Uh, but I'm also going to be working on the um, Brightspace grade system so that you'll to input all the, all the information there so you can also just see what your score is without having to ask me. But again, you can always ask me about it. Your scores are not secrets. I want you to know what your average is. Now, uh, let's see. Main thing for today is we're going to be starting chapter six. This will be about collisions and momentum. Uh, and next week we'll kind of just be back on a normal schedule, about a chapter a week, about a lab every week. So do come to lab next week. We're going to uh, use the air tracks and slam things into each other because I did say chapter six is partially about collisions. So again, main thing for today is starting chapter six. Um, I also still have some people's tests to give back. If you weren't here on Wednesday, I gave all the tests back. You are welcome to come grab yours. I have them all in an alphabetized file, so you can just ask me whatever you want. Once I give your test back to you, it is yours to keep, and you can compare it to the answer key that I put on Brightspace. Any questions, comments, concerns about anything at all from you guys? Yes? Do you have a date for our test, too? Right. Thank you for asking. I had one, and I don't remember what it is. So give me a second to look at my look at the calendar. October 13th, and my goal, like my ideal scenario, would be if we could get test two done the week before Thanksgiving so that you don't have to worry about it over Thanksgiving. Then when we come back, we spend a week finishing everything out before exam season starts. That's my ideal, and that's what I'm going to be shooting for. And we should be able to. Chapter six, seven, eight. Mm. That goal may not end up working out just depending on how long it takes us to get through the next couple of chapters. But that is my stated goal right now is the test will be either this week, if I'm if what I want happens, alternatively it will be the last week of class, um, Monday, November twenty-seventh through Friday, December 1st. So those will be the two possible options. Did that answer the question? Okay. Anything else on your minds right now? Test, midterm, upcoming info? Yes. For the final then, since it would be like in that same uh, month of December, mm -hmm. would would it be cumulative or would it be like for the new material? Uh, the final would be cumulative to all the material between test one and test two. Um, checking the academic calendar real quick so that I have everything in my head. I don't foresee. Kind of depends. 
My, uh, my stated goal is, again, for the test to be this week. If that does end up happening, then we have a week and change to close everything out and get ready for finals. And I usually like to have like one lecture on wave mechanics, just like the basics of how sound works uh, just before the semester ends, because it's good information to have. I like talking about it. I think it does cap off the course well. And if I do manage to have that lecture within the time before the last day of class, I might have like one concept question out of like 20 on the final about it. Okay. And it would also be on the practice final that I make for it. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Answer the question? Yes. Anything else on your minds? All right, well. Tried different uh, slideshow settings for a sec there, but they didn't quite work, so I'm going back to the old ones. <laughs> there we go. So, we're kicking off the second half of the course with chapter six Momentum and Collisions. Now, before we actually get into any material, because whenever we bring up a new term, especially one that like exists in common English vernacular. Like how the word momentum is occasionally used in everyday life. I want to see what you guys know of the word and then we then define its physics context. So at the top of your head, when you hear the word momentum, what do you think of? I think I heard someone say motion. Good, that is very correct. Um, when you when someone says momentum in like a, just a commonly encountered English sentence, what like what sort of situation does it come up in? Yeah. Running. Okay. Good. Okay, coming downhill, building up momentum on the way down. That is very accurate, very good. Um, I, for someone who doesn't particularly watch many sports, weirdly hear it in sports scenarios, like a team is building up momentum this season and it's really hard to stop. That, actually, and also, again, the moving downhill, those are all actually surprisingly accurate uses of the physics version of the word momentum. So the picture that may already exist in your head is probably actually pretty all right, but we're going to define it a little more closely. The other half of this chapter is going to be collisions, and the, the two go hand in hand. It's not like two separate halves. And we've talked, well, last chapter we were looking at how energy can transform from the beginning to end of a process. And we looked at a couple different processes where that can happen, say an object falling or an object rising, uh, an object pushing up against a spring or a spring uncoiling and pushing back against something. But there's another scenario that we've lightly touched on where energy transformations occur, and that is a collision. And the physics definition, well, the colloquial definition of a collision is two things running into each other somehow. And again, that's basically the physics definition. In physics, a collision is an interaction between two or more objects coming into physical contact with each other, and those objects exert force on each other for a certain amount of time. Every collision takes a certain amount of time. No collision is ever truly instantaneous. A car doesn't hit a wall and then immediately stop. It technically takes you know, a couple of milliseconds, and over those milliseconds, the car undergoes the process of changing shape into a pancake. So that process takes a certain amount of time. And that's why you can watch it on, you know, slow motion video, uh, high speed cameras can catch 
the event occurring and you can watch it, watch the process of the vehicle being pancaked. Again, watch old episodes of Mythbusters. Now, the, I'm mentioning again, collisions take time. And they, someone took away my trash can, so now I can't even throw this in the bin. Thank you. I'm mentioning that collisions take time because within a collision, force is exerted on the objects involved in the collision, causing them to accelerate. And acceleration changes velocity over time. So the purpose, again, of a collision is to change the velocity of everything involved in the collision. Car, crash test car hits wall, speed velocity of the car changes over those fractions of seconds, causing a very high acceleration on the mass of the car, therefore a very large amount of force acted on the car to bring it to a very sudden stop. Likewise, the car exerts a force on the wall, and that's probably why a few of its bricks are going to fly away in random directions. That force, the force involved in the collision, is kind of what causes everything we're going to be talking about in this chapter. The force involved in the crash causes acceleration, causing speed to change over time. And that force is capable not only of transferring energy between the two objects involved in the crash, but also the new concept of momentum. Kinetic energy, specifically, and momentum are actually pretty similar concepts. Objects can possess them. You know that something has them when the object is moving, and they can be transferred in a collision from one object to the other. Basically, in a crash, uh, from the energy's perspective, the force involved in the crash does work and takes energy from one object to the other. Say it again, a crash test car hits a wall, a crash test car has a lot of energy, suddenly the force the wall exerts on the car does work to take energy away from the car, now the wall has the energy, and that's why the bricks of the wall start breaking and scattering. Yes? Is that an A? I can't really see it. Yes, that is okay. an A. Just F equals sure. an A. I appreciate the marker, but unfortunately, this one was also dying. Any better? Alright. So, kinetic energy is usually transferred between objects in a collision. And you can usually tell that this happens because the velocities of the objects involved tend to change. Again, very fast crash test car suddenly goes from 60 to zero upon hitting a brick wall. Its velocity changes, its kinetic energy changes, and that energy has to go somewhere, usually into the wall, and once the wall has the energy again, it tends to break and its bricks tend to fly all over the place. But the energy is not the only thing that transfers. Momentum also transfers. We're gonna talk, we're gonna define momentum in a second. Before we define momentum, though, I want to talk again about the kinetic energy involved in this collision. Up until now, we have considered energy to usually be completely conserved in some mechanical state between processes. Uh, we would assume complete direct transference of Ke to GPE as something rises and falls, complete perfect transference of EPE to something else as a spring uncoils and launches something. But in nature, very rarely is a process ever completely 100% efficient like that. In nature, you do lose energy to places like friction, but collisions kind of further complicate that because, well, I assume you've watched this happen before. I'm about to drop this golf ball. It's gonna make a noise on impact, so just fair warning if you're Eyes are on your screen. Once again, note the initial height I drop it from. And it only rises back to here. Why'd that happen? Up till now, we've been assuming all the energy is totally maintained. 
It should have had enough energy to get back up to its starting height. Why didn't it? Was some of the energy transferred to the table once it got to the ground? Correct. Energy is transferred between objects in a collision. So even if this was like the best rubber ball, bouncy ball that I could get from a grocery store vending machine, it's still gonna lose some kinetic energy on impact because the very act of having a collision always transfers some kinetic energy into whatever the object is hitting. The only way to really get this thing back up to its original height is if I throw it. Oh, okay, it doesn't bounce great on the carpet. If I just drop it, it's never gonna come back up to its initial height on its own because it loses kinetic energy on impact. The kinetic energy can turn into lots of different forms. Namely, when it hits the ground, kinetic energy is gonna turn into things like heat because of friction from the air and from the surface. It also turns into sound because one of the things I like to, why I like to talk about sound at the end of the semester, sound is weird because it's just moving air. And for the air to move, it needs to have energy. So if you heard something, it means that some energy had to go into the air rather than staying in the object that made the sound. So when you hear the golf ball hit the table, that's proof that the ball had to lose some of its kinetic energy because the air had to gain some of it to start vibrating and for that vibration to travel to your ear. So the energy goes lots of different places, but the momentum doesn't because momentum doesn't have another form that it can turn into. Energy has lots of forms. Momentum only has one. So let's define it finally. Momentum. Uh, can be thought of as a measurement of how difficult an object is to stop. If something has momentum, the numerical measurement of that momentum can be thought of as a direct numerical measurement of how easy or difficult that object will be to cause its velocity to drop to zero. The more momentum something has, the more difficult it will be to stop. Meanwhile, if it has zero momentum, it's already stopped, so it's quite easy to make it stop if it's already stopped. Gesundheit to whoever that was. The formula for momentum is on your equation sheet. It is this one right here. It is rho equals mv. Check the formula sheet real quick that it actually says rho. Dang it, this has a P on it. I have to edit this. The most accurate way to write this formula is rho equals mv. That is not an English letter V, and it's also not capitalized. It is a lowercase Greek rho. Rho is spelled like this, R-H-O. There's not a fraternity or sorority on campus with a rho in it, is there? I don't think there is. But that's how it's spelled if you were trying to spell it like a word. It kind of looks like a lowercase p. The primary difference between rho and a lowercase p is that traditionally, lo lowercase English p has this little thing, like a stem or something attached at the upper left, whereas rho is just smooth all the way around. Further distinguished again from uppercase p, which you know, is uppercase. So technically it's supposed to be rho equals mv, and I want, I'm saying that because I think of it as rho. I'm going to say rho equals mv, so I want to make sure that you know what I mean when I say that. Rho equals mv. Rho is the momentum. If you want to call it rho-mentum to help with that, you are allowed. We're entering the branch of physics where we ran out of English letters, so we had to start using Greek ones. I don't have a very good justification for why it's rho as opposed to like lowercase p. Lowercase m was definitely already taken from mass, and 
We don't really use uppercase M because sometimes people use that for mass anyway. So it got saddled with rho for historical reasons that I don't fully understand. And since it can be thought of as a measurement of how hard it is to bring something to a stop, that again influences the formula. Rho equals mass times velocity. Mass and current velocity are the two biggest indications of how difficult something is going to be to stop. Because if something is moving fast, it's going to take a lot of effort to bring it to a stop. You know this if you've ever been driving a car at you know 80 on the highway and suddenly had to bring it to a full stop because you crested over a hill and suddenly you can see three miles of traffic. If you're going fast, it takes effort to come to a stop. But also, if, you, if an object has more mass, it is harder to stop. You know this if you've specifically been driving a truck at interstate speeds. More mass something has, the harder it is to stop. Those two things combined multiply together to become momentum. And namely, I want to point this out now, since velocity is a vector, so is momentum. That's why both the rho and the v are underlined. Momentum is a vector, and it always points in the same direction as the velocity, because momentum not only tells you how hard something is to stop, it also tells you the direction it wants to keep moving in. If I've been talking about the crash, the crash test car example a lot. Uh, if you are doing a crash test with a car, and it's a say like a big car, like a truck, and you're going to remote control drive it into a wall, the car's momentum wants it to keep moving in the same direction, and that's why it might possibly just plow through the wall and keep moving in the same direction. So momentum's a vector; it shares the same direction as the velocity used to calculate it. And it is a new variable, so I'll tell you it's a unit. It does not have its own specialized unit, unfortunately. Its unit is just a composite of the two things used to find it. The unit is kilograms times meters per second. There's not actually supposed to be a squared there. Pardon me, I made a mistake. Cool, please. more complicated and also wrong. If you already copied down the squared seconds, please erase it. I'm deleting it now as soon as my computer decides to work. The unit for momentum is just kilograms times meters per second. There's no squared. And that's because to find it, you multiply mass in kilograms times meters per second velocity. It does not have its own specialized unit. Again, kind of like why we use rho, I don't have a good historical reason why. We just never had an, a scientist put their name on the unit, I guess. Specifically, and weirdly, Newton is actually the one that did most of Europe's work on momentum. Like most of our momentum equations came from Newton. And we already put his name on the force unit. I guess they just didn't decide to use his first name and call it Isaacs. And then that, that would have made sense to me, but I don't make the rules, unfortunately. My computer is not playing along with me today. So I'll point out again, rho equals nv, unit is kilogram times meters per second. It is a pain to say. It's also kind of a pain to write. Three whole letters for, actually four whole letters for one unit. questions about the definition of momentum itself for now? All right, it's back. All right. We 
have a new formula, so let's very quickly practice it. We have four different scenarios here of four different entities. Three of them are objects and one of them is an organic life form. With different masses all moving at different speeds. Very quickly, I would like you to tell me which of these four scenarios contains the most momentum. It's not A. It's reasonable to think A because buildings have very large masses. However, the formula for momentum is M times V. And if an object is stationary and its velocity is zero, doesn't matter how much mass it has, it's always going to have zero momentum. A stationary building is actually quite easy to stop if it has already stopped. If the building was moving, we'd have a problem, but this one thankfully is stationary. So the building, as long as it's stationary, has no momentum, and therefore is actually the lowest in this scenario. Do you see the bullet? Bullet is also a reasonable guess because it's moving very fast. But for context, this is just shy of three times the speed of sound. Uh, however, bullets tend to have teeny tiny masses. You'd have to convert that to kilograms first. Would it be the car? Uh, it would not be the car because you have to convert centimeters into meters. So let's actually do all these calculations real fast. Uh, Hundred thousand times zero is zero. How many grams is ten? How many kilograms is ten grams? Point zero one. Uh, point zero one. Because to go from base to kilo, that's divide by a thousand or drag decimal point three spaces to the left. So if it was one gram, it would be 0 .00 kilograms, but it's 10 grams, so it's 10 times 0 .001. 0 .01 times that very big velocity actually only gives us 10 kilogram meters per second of momentum. I'm going to skip C for reasons you'll see in a minute. For the car, very big mass, but it's inching forward very slowly at just one centimeter per second. This would be like idling uphill or trying to idle uphill if it's not even on the gas. How many meters per second is one centimeter per second? 0 0.01, very good. Going from centi to base is dragging it two places to the left, which would only give us 20 kilogram meters per second. And that just leaves the dog. 25 kilograms, 10 meters per second, nothing here needs converting. So 25 times 10 is 250. If you've ever watched videos of like guard dogs being trained, like the videos of them rushing headlong at someone in that big foam suit, a dog like jump tackling you square in the chest is taking you to the ground. So the dog is the most momentum in this scenario. My own puppy isn't even that big. She's like, She's not technically a puppy anymore, but she's short. Uh, 40, 40 pounds, about yay tall. Gunning at full speed, if she jumped right into my leg, my leg would be going out from under me and I am hitting the ground. So, questions about the sample now? Again, uh, it can be thought of as a measurement of how hard something is to stop. Uh, a uh, stationary building, very easy to stop. It's already stopped. Car moving very slowly, all you really have to do is just put your foot on the bumper. Now, if it was a car moving very fast, or 
the building somehow moving very fast, like maybe a train of the same mass, that would be a very difficult object to stop. That's when you have to have the Hulk jump out in front of it. Now, before we move on, quick disclaimer, I have mentioned the concept of inertia before, namely in relationship to Newton's first law. Newton's first law is the one that states an object at rest stays at rest and an object in motion stays in motion until acted upon by an outside force. Inertia says that whatever an object is currently doing, it wants to keep doing, and that includes standing still. Momentum is similar, but distinct. I just want to disclaimer that before we get any further in our discussion of momentum. Momentum is a vector that only exists when something is moving. Again, the formula is mass times velocity. If your velocity is zero, you have no momentum. But an object always has inertia, even if it isn't moving. Because Newton's law says an object at rest stays at rest. And an object's inertia, which is really just its mass, tells you how strongly something wants to remain at rest. Whereas if it's at rest, it has no momentum, it's already stopped. They measure two slightly different things. So that's just a very quick disclaimer. I'm gonna keep using the word momentum. If you want to call it inertia, I will kindly but firmly remind you that they're not the same thing. Inertia is a scalar. You can have inertia while you're sitting still. Momentum is a vector. You only have momentum while moving. Questions? All right. Now, let's talk about why momentum and kinetic energy are both, are kind of frustratingly similar to one another. Momentum has only one form that it can take. I mentioned earlier that kinetic energy can turn into all kinds of different forms of energy in some sort of a process, namely a collision. Where did I put my golf ball? Because again, when I drop this golf ball, its GPE turns into KE, and then upon collision with the desk, that KE is gonna turn into all kinds of different things all at once. Some of it will become EPE in the golf ball, and that's why the golf ball bounces back up. But because it doesn't return to the same height, we know some of that energy became other things like heat in the desk, sound in the air. That kinetic energy goes all sorts of places. But the momentum has no other form it can take. There's not like kinetic momentum or gravitational potential momentum. It's just momentum. There is nothing else it can turn into. And for that reason, it is very similarly conserved to energy. In chapter five, we talked about the conservation of energy. All the energy that exists in something will continue to exist after a process takes place, even if it's in a different form or in a different object. And momentum is eerily similar. If there is a certain amount of momentum within a certain total amount of momentum, the lump sum of the momentum in a system before something happens, the same total amount of momentum will remain in the system after that something has happened. Namely collisions. We're mainly going to be using this to look at the before versus after state of collisions. So that will be the main type of question we examine within chapter 6 before versus after of some collision process where two things interact and their speeds change because they're trading momentum and kinetic energy. So, like how there's conservation of energy, there's also conservation of momentum. And so what that says is, Total momentum initial, sigma rho i, equals total momentum final, sigma rho f. All the momentum that exists in something before a process takes place will be the same total value after the process takes place, even if the momentum 
loc like relocates into a different object. But thankfully, there's no other forms it takes. It's just momentum either side. Questions so far? Yes? But the momentum can like change like during the process, right? It can change what object has it. It just can't turn into something else. It's still momentum. Like the kinetic energy can turn into EPE back to GPE. It can turn into heat. It can turn into sound. But the momentum only has one form. Did I answer the question? Yeah, it's still a little bit confusing, but it's okay. That's fair. It, and it is kind of confusing because when I drop the golf ball, again, noise incoming, and it doesn't rise to the same height, that's not only because it loses energy on impact, it's also because it does technically lose momentum on impact. And the momentum goes into the desk. And the desk doesn't really do anything with that momentum. From our perspective, it kind of looks like it stays still. But that's because the momentum has a lot of mass. It's also attached to the planet, which also has a lot of mass. So the momentum is conserved. It's just the object that gains it is huge, and therefore it doesn't really move as a result. Does that address any of your concerns? Okay. Yeah. Normal amount of momentum given to a massive object, teeny tiny velocity. And that's why a human jumping up and down on the surface of the planet doesn't cause the planet to go anywhere. Or even dropping an anvil on the planet doesn't cause the planet to go anywhere. It's also why meteors don't knock us off our axis very often, thankfully. Questions thus far? All right. Now I did say we were going to be applying this to collision type questions, so let us at least begin examining such a problem before we break for the day. We're going to cause a collision, namely we're going to fire an arrow at a log. The standard archery club practice. And since this process has a distinct before versus after, I'm going to define both stages as I'm drawing a picture for this situation. Arrow. Log. Arrow's initial velocity is 25 meters per second and it has a very teeny tiny mass of 10 grams. The log is initially stationary and it has a much bigger mass of 5 kilograms. Big compared to the arrow at least. This is our before state watching the arrow through the air right before impact. Upon impact, the arrow is likely going to embed itself in the wood. And now they are functionally united as one common object. And we need to figure out how fast the log is going to be knocked back by the arrow. I want to know, is the log going to visibly recoil from this impact? So we're going to try to solve for the log's final speed as a result of the arrow hitting it. As I said, conservation of momentum akin to conservation of energy. All the momentum that exists in the before scenario will continue to exist in the after scenario. 
Now initially, where's all the momentum? In the air. It's the only thing that's moving. So it would be the only thing here that has any momentum. So sum of all the momentums, that's going to be momentum, arrow, initial, plus momentum log initial, but the log's not moving, so that's going to be zero. They'll be add up to the same total as the final total sum. The same two objects exist over here, but they're going to have different speeds as a result of the impact. Again, the point of the impact is the two objects exert forces on each other, arrow slows down, log will speed up a little bit, teeny tiny bit, that's what the recoil is. And so the sum of their initial momenta, momenta the plural of momentum is momenta, weirdly. Kind of like how the plural of curriculum is curricula. Their initial momentums will total and equal the same as the total of their finals. Now again, initially the arrow has all the momentum, but afterwards, upon impact, they're gonna be sharing all of the momentum that the arrow brought to the party. Go back to the initial side real quick. Momentum is mass times velocity, so that's gonna be the arrow's mass times the arrow's initial speed. We do want kilograms. So if we all had to convert 10 grams into kilograms there. The arrow's initial speed is 25. Meanwhile, the log's mass is five, but its initial speed is zero. Again, the log's not bringing any momentum to the party. The arrow brought all the momentum. Initially, it has all of it, but upon impact with the log, now it has to share. So on the after side, you have the same two masses moving at some different unknown final velocity. We don't know what that final speed is for either object, but we do know that since arrows tend to stick into wood, they're going to be stuck together. They have to be moving at the same speed afterwards because they're stuck, kind of like how the two masses tied to the same rope will be accelerating at the same speed. Here, the two objects physically stuck, whatever their final speed is, they will share it, because now they're also one object sharing all the momentum that the arrow brought. So the momentum the arrow had is now going to be dispersed across both objects. It's gonna give up a lot of its own momentum to get the log moving. How's this feel so far? And we can use this fact to our advantage. Here we're going to use it to find the final speed of the shared com combo arrow log object, which you know also just tells us the speed the log is going to get knocked back at. On the left side, the log didn't have any initial momentum, so this whole term just goes away, 5 times 0. The arrow's initial momentum it actually doesn't have that much because its mass is teeny tiny. So that's just 0.25 on the initial side. On the final side, we have the same VF in two places. So I'm just going to use the distributive property to simplify that. VF times open parentheses 0 .00, 0 0.01 plus 5. So VF should equal 0.25 divided by 5.01, and that would give us a very teeny tiny final answer. One fifth of 25, so just shy of 0 0.05. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. And that is so slow, you might not even notice the recoil. You might not even notice the log flinch on impact. And this makes sense. If you throw a teeny tiny object at a big object, you're not going to notice the big object move as a result. It's kind of, again, what I said about the golf ball hitting the table. You're not going to notice the table flinch from the recoil because the table's massive, and the table's also attached to the earth, which is even more massive. So tiny objects colliding with big ones, you don't often notice the final speed because 
The momentum that the small object brings is usually not enough to make the big object move very much. How's this feel both mathematically and in terms of your own life experience noticing these sorts of things? Does this number feel right, given, again, life experience? All right. Chapter six is going to kind of be a lot of this. And we'll look at different types of collisions, see how the math works for those. We're also going to bring kinetic energy back into it eventually, start talking about the times where it is, it is versus is not conserved. So, let me know if you need anything, if you have any questions about this or force grids and stuff in general. And, reminder no lab today. There is lab next week. I'm rambling. Have a nice weekend. No lab today. There is lab today. No lab today.